Some economists argue that financial aid to developing countries is, in the long run, inefficient and even counterproductive. However, there are two main types of aid that we will deal with here. First, there is long-term aid to countries such as Ethiopia and Somalia, where there are recurrent problems such as drought and poor agricultural production, and where there is little or no industry to speak of, problems that won't go away with an injection of money. Then there is emergency aid, which also appeals for contributions from the public, when a disaster of one kind or another strikes. Recent examples would be the earthquake in Haiti, and the tsunami in Japan. In the case of emergency aid, it arrives in the first instance as food, clothing, shelter, and medical aid, all of which are of immediate practical use and great benefit. With countries that have long-term developmental problems, just pumping in money is not enough and, sad to say, a lot of the money doesn't go where it should. What is more important is providing know-how, teaching the skills and expertise needed to help develop the economy and social services such as health, sanitation, and so on. It is also necessary to help build the institutions, a bureaucracy, if you like, that can organize and run these services.
Interviewer, now, Professor, recently you wrote a letter to a leading national newspaper complaining about falling standards in both written and spoken language among students, even graduates, and saying that you deplore the way English is being debased by change and dumbing down, interviewee, yes, I said that standards are falling and that very few graduates these days can write a comprehensible essay, their grammar and syntax is all over the place, um. And I do have certain regrets over the way some words have now become unusable in their full meaning because they've been sloppily misused by those who should know better, such as journalists. So, because they use, say, enormity to mean something very big instead of something very wicked, I can no longer use the word in its correct sense without being misunderstood. And there are hundreds of other cases like this. But, of course, language changes, and meanings shift and change emphasis, and it's as useless to complain about that as it is to moan about the weather. The point I was making was that, at the earliest possible level, children should be made familiar with the basics of grammar and syntax, how to put sentences together, and so on. But I'm not suggesting going back to the days when, as I did, you had to analyze sentences in minute detail as if you were doing Latin. Though, of course, there is something to be said for having that kind of detailed understanding of the language.
Yes, it's funny you should mention Merwin. Until about a year ago I thought England was the only country that had a poet laureate. After all, it's a pretty odd job, isn't it? No salary to speak of and just a barrel of wine or something is payment. But he was or is the American poet laureate, isn't he? Speaker 2, that's right, but quite a few other countries have one too. Speaker 1, I know, I looked into it a bit. Other countries in the UK for a start, Wales, as you'd expect, with their ice dead fods and long poetic tradition, and Ireland and Scotland. I think some places that were colonies or are in the Commonwealth have them, Canada, for example. And who's that wonderful Caribbean poet, Ern, the one that wrote Omros? Speaker 2, Derek Walcott. Speaker 1, that's him. He was the poet laureate of St. Lucia. But what about the rest of Europe? Don't the French have such a thing? Speaker 2, no, I don't think so. They've got the academy, and you get elected to that if you're considered the best in your field. But I think Germany might have, no, it wasn't Germany. Somewhere else, but I don't remember. By the way, you're a bit behind the times in thinking what they get paid is a barrel of wine. All that changed long ago, but one of the more recent ones asked to have it back. It is difficult to know how to place Montesquieu, if you're the kind of person who likes to, answer, categorize. Historian, political philosopher, sociologist, jurist or, if you think the Persian letters a novel, a novelist, he was all these things. Perhaps, as some have, he could be placed among that almost extinct species, the man of letters. The books that make up the spirit of the laws have had the most influence, on later thinkers, and in them, as in his equally great considerations on the causes of the grandeur and decadence of the Romans, he makes his underlying purpose clear. It is to make the random, apparently meaningless variety of events understandable, he wanted to find out what the historical truth was. His starting point then was this almost endless variety of morals, customs, ideas, laws and institutions and to make some sense out of them. Privacy and the right to privacy are increasingly becoming hot topics, in the media, which is a touch, answer, ironic, given that it is often the media that is responsible for invasion of privacy. This is not just about those whose careers put them in the public eye, but ordinary people who through no fault of their own have come to public notice because of some event that has attracted the attention of the media. It might be that a member of their family has been imprisoned, for some crime, rightfully, or wrongfully, or perhaps they are the victims of some natural disaster. Some people argue that those who have chosen to be in the public sphere, and have teams of public relations, people to make sure they get as much public attention as possible, actors, rock stars, politicians and the like, have given up their right to privacy and get everything they deserve. There is such a thing as information overload. There is just so much information out there now that we can't cope with it or fully absorb it, or even decide which bits of it we want to keep in our minds, or which to discard. There is a similar thing going on with the range of choices we have as consumers. There is so much stuff out there, so much to choose from, that, according to some experts, this situation is making us miserable. Most of us believe that the more we have to choose from the better, yet apparently our dissatisfaction with this wealth of choice, or rather the anxiety it produces, is part of a larger tract. It seems that, as society grows more affluent, 
and people become freer to do what they want, the unhappier they become. All whales, dolphins, and porpoises are social animals, although the degree of sociability varies greatly from one species to another. Differences of behavior have not evolved by chance. Living in close proximity to other animals has certain costs and benefits, so we can expect the group size adopted by a species to be the most suitable for its environment and lifestyle. River dolphins, for example, have a fairly simple social system, forming small groups of just a few animals rarely more than 10. On the other hand, many of the oceanic dolphins may roam the seas in groups of thousands. Also, there can be differences within species, for example, with sperm whales, females and juveniles form groups while adult males are solitary. Some of the reasons for living in groups include greater efficiency in searching for and catching food, benefits for mating, learning, defense, and sensory integration. Now, Sensory integration is the means by which each animal contributes to the information gained by the group as a whole, and this plays an important part in defense and in the search for food. For example, if one animal discovers a shoal of fish or a hungry shark, it can immediately pass on this information to the others in the group so that all may benefit. A single animal or small group may remain unaware of the food or predator, and so miss a meal or suffer an attack. The basic English person's diet in medieval times was made up of bread, cheese and beef, while ale was the drink for all ages and social classes except for the aristocracy, who drank wine. In winter there were no root crops to feed the animals, so they were killed in autumn and the meat salted to preserve it. People kept livestock even in the towns, cows were usually kept tied or tethered, but pigs were allowed to wander at will, feeding on the rubbish off the streets. By the 16th century, However, choice in foodstuffs had grown, including exotic spices to add flavor to the usual diet. This had come about because European rulers wanting to increase their power and wealth and also, in fairness, in the spirit of inquiry and the quest for knowledge, had financed voyages of exploration overseas. This opened up trade routes, bringing precious spices, and vast profits, from the east, and to the west Spanish and Portuguese explorers had brought back such novelties as potatoes, tomatoes, maize, peppers and chocolate. It must be said, though, that it took people some time to accept some of these new foods, as they feared they were poisonous. When you first examine something under a microscope, say a leaf from a plant, you're amazed at how much detail there is and it's detail that you simply cannot see without magnification. And what you can see with the naked eye becomes suddenly huge under the lens. How big everything looks is astonishing but it's also amazingly intricate. Suddenly it's as if another world has opened up in front of your eyes and you think, hey, I hadn't realized that something so small, so tiny, could be so.
Ah, sleep. There's nothing better than a nice, long, uninterrupted. Ah. I can't sleep when there's. But do you ever notice, noise doesn't wake everyone. Now scientists, have a better idea why. Because sound sleepers, show a certain brain rhythm when they doze, findings published in the journal Current Biology. To study the brain waves of a good night's sleep, scientists invited volunteers to snooze in the lab. While the subjects caught some Zs, the monitored, their brain activity. They then subjected, the sleepers to or, noise. And they found that those who were able to slumber straight, through all this showed more short bursts of faster brain waves. This activity, the scientists say, is the brain's way of blocking, out the in the while you're trying to rest. The scientists don't yet know of any way to boost those sleep-saving brain waves. So until then, shut the door, make sure the late show's on a timer, and try to have sweet dreams. It's an approach to pest control that's so crazy it just might work, convince the females that they're virgins. It would be useless as human birth control, of course, but the difference is that most female insects completely change their behavior, after sex. For example, some start laying eggs. What's behind this anoxic mosquitoes, suck blood. Others lose interest in males' dramatic, change in behavior? Turns out it's a peptide in the male's seminal fluid. And now researchers in Vienna have found the female's receptor, for this peptide. They report online in Nature that fruit flies, without the receptor. Business majors learn valuable skills from leadership and entrepreneurship. Assignments should be submitted before the specified deadline to avoid penalties. Maintaining good health is essential for a productive college experience. Effective communication is crucial for success in the business world. 